have uh, five coverlets in the exhibit. Um, the one um, pictured here, um, completely uh, displayed, is a Craig coverlet. Craig family wove uh, coverlets in Decatur County. On uh, Indiana coverlets and also um, any made during this period, the corner block was their trademark. So uh, the courthouse pictured is the Decatur County Courthouse. Um, this was woven in 1848. The Decatur County Courthouse pictured burnt and uh, was replaced with the one that's there now in 1890. So this is a, a picture or a use of the early version of the courthouse. Um, this was done by the Craig family, as I mentioned and is a really well done example. It's tightly woven. The coverlets are made of indigo wool and the cream collar cotton. Uh, the wool is uh, a natural dye. Um, indigo was used to get blue during this time period. Uh, the border is uh, elaborate, includes a mosque and uh, an exotic bird with feeding its babies. So there's a lot of detail in these coverlets. They were drafted uh, onto punch cards and the uh, woven on a jacquard loom. Uh, this was considered a man's occupation, an industry for men. Uh, the weavers that moved into Indiana out of Ohio and Pennsylvania, uh, a lot of them were Scottish. Uh, we have a Muir family coverlet uh, in the exhibit. Uh, we also have a Samuel Stinger uh, coverlet, and then one uh, woven by D.L. Myers in uh, Ohio uh, for the Hudgel family who settled here in Madison County. With the start of the Civil War, um, the uh, weavers were no longer able to get the cotton yarn, which is the light color yarn in the coverlets, from the South. Um, the weaving of them declined. Um, by the end of the Civil War, the Victorian decorating period was coming in when things got um, more flowery, fancier, fussier, and um, these were considered old-fashioned and fell out of favor. However, it, it appears in the research that was done for a book published in the 70s on Indiana weavers that um, most of the weavers um, financially did very well with their business. Uh, they were farmers with uh, um, pretty good holdings on the census, later census. Um, it was said that they could probably weave one coverlet a day and they sold them for ten dollars approximately a piece. Um, that was what uh, Sarah Latre, the female weaver, um, uh, was quoted as saying that she could um, get from her coverlets. The dress in the frame was donated to the Historical Society um, by the family of Albert Preston, who was born in 1862. It's a special item just because of the time period and the uh, style and the fact that it's a boy's dress. But also, we just recently found out that in 1856, an 18-year-old uh, was given an assignment by his professor to synthesize quinine and he failed in the experiment but what was left over the residue was this mauve collar. Um, Mysteries at the Museum had a segment on it. It was the first commercial dye, um, instantly popular because up until this point we only had n uh, natural dyes and uh, this was a, a brighter, uh, more vibrant collar than had been available to people. Queen Victoria, they said, uh, wore a dress this color to one of her daughter's weddings and of course that instantly made it uh, something everybody had to have. Being in 1862, by 
uh, this, when this dress was made or when Albert was born, uh, of course there were other dyes developed by then, but this is an example of the collar of the first commercial dye available. A Civil War era bodice in the case here um, is an example of the style popular um, during the Civil War era, during the mid-1800s. Um, it almost certainly had a skirt attached to it, though that may have been uh, taken off when the person outgrew the, the bodice and then they would have repurposed or reuse the fabric in the skirt because nothing went to waste. So, uh, not sh you know, I have no history on it, so I'm not sure um, where it came from. Or, um, um, but it is a, a really kind of a nice example of the, that era. Uh, we have a collection that was donated to us um, that belonged to Liana Hudgel. Um, they lived on a farm on East 10th Street, past east of Range Line, so in the area where the Geatings Theater and the Girl Scout camp was. I, I've been told there's a housing addition around it now, but the house is still standing. Uh, the clothes represent more a pioneer period and, and not a, a dressy Sunday afternoon uh, dress like we have um, in the other room. She made uh, uh, several of these tops. Uh, the, her cape is here. There's also a child's robe. Um, the sunbonnet, which she would have worn one like it, uh, was from another donation to the society. Uh, women uh, did not want to uh, have the sun on their face or uh, neck, so they, they wore these large oversized sunbonnets to shield them from the sun. Women back then, I've been told, would lay out brown paper on a table, take scissors or pencil, draw out a pattern, cut it out, and make themselves something. They, they, they knew how to construct garments. That one and the black one are made from the same pattern, but she's cut the sleeves different and the collar different on them. And then that's her wearing her Sunday apron in the picture up above that. That came with a note saying that it was her Sunday apron. Yeah, it did have a note attached to it that it was her apron. So I'm I go by that. Somebody wrote it a long time ago. In this section of boys' clothing, we have a pair of um, breeches that are white cotton. But the, the interesting thing about these, besides their shape, which is a little odd, is if, if you notice, there's an extra seam um, on the left side and a small seam in the uh, upper right corner. Um, it shows that when they were cutting this, uh, these out and making them, they used every last piece of fabric. So if it meant insetting a little tiny piece in the top, that's what they did. We have some examples of boys' dresses. Um, on each side of the um, pantaloons, we have dresses that were worn in 1915 by Janine Jackson's uh, father. Above it, we have a little boys' dress, and it's a little heavier cotton. Uh, not as dainty looking uh, with the but side buttons and a monogram and a stand-up collar um, makes it a little more boyish though uh, during that time period boys did wear dresses uh, up until about three or four years old. There's nothing in particular other than um, in general these are older dresses from the mid to late 1800s, with the exception of the two on the left end. The one in the middle on the top is a Civil War era. Again, the off-the-shoulder silhouette that we saw in the bodice in the case. And then the one on the uh, left on the top 
was what started me collecting children's clothing. That's the very first baby's dress I bought at an auction at by Frankton. It's not as early, it's 1900s, early 1900s, but uh, that's, that's the piece that started it all. The wagon uh, is, has been a recent donation to the society this fall. The uh, family of the original owner donated it to us so it would stay in the area. Uh, it was actually a gift to a little girl in 1890 um, by her grandfather. Uh, we have a picture, a photo there, of her daughter playing with it in 1917. It's all original paint, iron wheels. It's in, in beautiful condition. The pink dress in the center over there um, has a New Orleans store label in it. So, um, 1930s probably era, but it's interesting because it's organdy, so it's very lightweight and sleeveless to go with their climate uh, in New Orleans. Pretty little example of a later, later dress. Uh, the four dresses hanging are uh, infant day dresses, a um, few different sizes, but uh, this is what was typically worn um, by babies uh, up until they were walking. The, uh, these particular dresses uh, came from England. From the Hedgel family, we also uh, received this log cabin quilt, um, very typical design of the period. Uh, what is interesting is this was tied instead of quilted, hand quilted. Um, also, tying quilts was uh, um, a way of finishing them without um, all the hand quilting, the time put into them hand quilting. Uh, and they were used, it was usually used uh, on more utilitarian quilts that were there just to keep you warm and not so much be decorative. The green, red and green stripe fabric um, is the back of it. You notice the, the pattern she used is, is similar to quilting patterns or would have been used on a quilt, but she's put um, time and effort into making something pretty that's, that's going to keep her warm. The top of it is flannel, um, and that is what lines it. Um, that was so there wasn't as much bulk up at the waist. The child's petticoat next to it that's the brown in color was also made that way. It's, has, it's all lined with wool batting and has been hand quilted with a red lining. And that came from uh, one of the states in the upper Midwest, so a cold climate. That's what speaks to me about so many of these things, is the, the heart that they put into them. The quilt in the hallway um, was made by Lily Mae Terilliger Castor in 1955 uh, for her granddaughter, uh, Lucretia Lawler, who uh, Lou Lawler is our, the uh, president of the Historical Society. Uh, she started it in 1945 and finished it in 1955. Um, she made a quilt for each of her uh, 13 grandchildren, and uh, Lou received hers as a college graduation gift. The Indiana State Museum had a, a day when everybody could bring in their quilts for them to look at and evaluate. Um, they chose this one to be part of an exhibit that hung in the State Museum for a few months. Uh, the pattern is called Down the Garden Path. It was also featured in a book called Quilts of Indiana, Crossroads of Memories, which was part of an Indiana quilt registry project.